excited here for for this for this meeting. And it's a great lineup of a couple of uh, speakers here. Um, I'll introduce our speakers in just a moment. Okay. I'll introduce our speakers in just a moment. Let me just say that um, that small businesses and, and researchers have a critical need for funding to support their development and growth. And um, and we think that uh, if you guys, if you're a member of the Syracuse COE partner program, um, which takes as members industry and researchers, you will receive a weekly update on funding opportunities that are available and including solicitations that are outstanding. So. Um, those of you that are interested in um, in, in supporting um, growth of startups or your, your own research, um, please think about becoming a, a member of the Syracuse COE Partners Program. You can talk to, to Tammy in the back there about how to join our Partners Program. Um, so I, we're going to have um, two speakers um, this, evening, this afternoon. Um, the first speaker is Julianne Clothier from FuzzHub. So just to give you a little background on FuzzHub, and I'm sure Julianne will give us a little bit more, uh, FuzzHub is a, is a key player in New York State's innovation ecosystem. It is a nonprofit organization that serves as New York State's Manufacturing Extension Partnership Center, MEP Center. And it's supported by uh, Empire State Development's Division of Science, Technology, and Innovation, NYSTAR. Um, so its role, I'm sure again, Julianne will speak more about this, its role, um, BuzzHub's role is to support manufacturers and startups with guidance and expertise, funding, resources, assistance with R&D and commercialization, and more. And I have to say that Julianne and her colleagues have really become a, a valued partner for many companies throughout New York State. Our second speaker is from... Um, is from uh, ducted wind turbines. Um, I don't know if Joe is Joe is around online or okay. Hi Joe, Joe Dixon, um, Joe Dixon from um, ducted air turbines. And ducted air turbines is a research-based startup uh, based in the North Country that's developing the next generation turbine systems. Ducted turbine has received support from COE's innovation fund as a as a as an innovation partner of ours, um, and it, and it's also received um, support from other members of the New York State innovation ecosystem. So let me begin by introducing Julianne Colbier from FuzzHub. Julianne is the industry engagement manager for FuzzHub. Julianne oversees the uh, Jeff Lawrence Innovation Fund, which is comprised of manufacturing grants, a commercialization competition, and an innovation challenge. The fund provides a million dollars annually to nonprofits, manufacturers, and early stage technology companies in New York. Julianne herself has over 10 years of economic development experience and has worked on numerous microenterprise business expansion and infrastructure projects. Julianne is a member of the Tech Valley High School Business Alliance and serves as a mentor, judge, and panelist for numerous innovation and entrepreneurial programs. Julianne has an MBA from the University of Albany, Bachelor of Arts in Communication from Mercyhurst College, and is a recent graduate of Albany CanCode Front End Web, web Development. So, um, that introduction, here's Julianne. Thank you very much. So, thank you to Tammy and uh, everybody at the COE for having me out here today. Um, I know for some of you, I've kind of heard uh, some discussions taking place. So this might be in the weeds for some of you. They asked me to cover all of FUSUB. There's a lot going on at FUSUB since we cover the whole state. So I'm gonna talk about our manufacturing grants, our commercialization competition. And then I'm also gonna cover some of the other programs and services that we have at FUSUB. We have uh, quite a variety of different things uh, happening within the state ecosystem. So. If something um, doesn't ring a bell to you right now, you know, it might be something that you might want to go back and, and tell a colleague or a company that you might be working with. So as Laura had mentioned, Fuse Hub is the statewide manufacturing extension partnership uh, funded under the U.S. Department of Commerce and the National Institute of Standards and Technology. There is an MEP center in every one of the 50 states. Um, generally, there's only one, but 
New York uh, likes to be different. So we have 11 centers. Um, USUB is the statewide center, and then we have 10 regional centers. The one in Syracuse would be the, the TDO. Uh, we do, uh, as I mentioned, several things across the state. So we work to provide expertise to manufacturers in a variety of different ways. Um, we connect NYSTAR programs. Um, we also have a solutions program, which I'll talk more in detail about, uh, who are actually boots on the ground working with manufacturers trying to identify their, their daily challenges and how we can help move them towards growth. Um, and then we also work on a lot of statewide projects. There's always different grants that we're applying for. Um, we have a build for scale program that I know that they're bringing here to Syracuse that some of you may be really interested in. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, the Jeff Lawrence Innovation Fund, which is statewide. We've given away uh, you know, several million dollars and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So these are just some of the uh, impacts across the state in terms of the whole MEP center and how we are working to help um, the manufacturing center um, over $8 million in uh, a different uh, variety of impacts and then over 5,000 jobs, new and retained jobs that have um, been accomplished through the, the MEP program. So this is primarily what I focus on, the Jeff Lawrence Innovation Fund. It's been around for only about three or four years now, and we've given away over $4 million to uh, 54 manufacturing grants, commercialization competition, innovation challenge, and um, some other smaller programs. So as you can see, you know, we've helped over 80 plus companies in 2020. We hope that that number is gonna go to over 100 companies. And it's a very small staff. For the first year and a half, I was the only person working in the program, traveling all across New York State, doing business development and managing the fund. We uh, brought on a person to kind of help with the admin side of it and getting our platform online. So it's, it's grown tremendously. Uh, there's no shortage of manufacturers or um, researchers looking for funding. So it's been a, a steady growth uh, for the innovation fund. So what does the Innovation Fund do? Well, we work with not-for-profits and manufacturers, and we try to bring that collaboration um, into the mainstream. Uh, the Innovation Fund itself is $3 million for the manufacturing grants, 54 projects. Um, right now, we just launched the February round, so I'm taking you know, calls and emails from different um, people who are new to the system, people who might have applied um, in the past. We, we're starting to see more uh, repeat applications, but you know, we work with a variety of different types of projects to help, uh, you know, commercialize products and technologies. Uh, it doesn't have to be a university, but we do see a lot of, um, you know, researchers come in for the program. Uh, for 2020, we're expecting to give away $700,000 in awards, uh, $350,000 in two funding rounds in February and in May. Um, it's generally around 12 projects. Our grants are about $50,000, but we do get companies um, and projects that come in anywhere from 20,000 to 50,000. So that number could be, you know, 12 to 14 uh, different types of projects. So as I mentioned, it might get into the weeds for some people, but who is eligible to apply? So for the manufacturing grants, it's our not-for-profits. Uh, they must partner with a New York State manufacturer and new this year. Uh, they have to have a valid manufacturing NAICS code. We're really trying to stick to the um, mission of what FuseHub does, and that's work with manufacturers. So that's a really critical change for us this year. Uh, we're always happy to help walk people through that process and, and make sure that it's really in alignment with what we're trying to do. Uh, community colleges only get one application. Universities can get three applications across the entire university. And as I was telling Tammy, sometimes it can be a challenge because there's multiple departments and people aren't going to know necessarily who is applying, but we try to work um, with people through that. So if we see an application come in, but one of the questions that I get asked a lot is, you know, do you know who's applying? And sometimes we don't know because the bulk of people don't apply until the day before the applications are due. So it's, it can be hard, but uh, to, to make that determination for people. And, you know, if Syracuse were to come in for, with four applications, we would just have to go to the top level at the university and try to figure out who would make the determination of who those projects are. Fuse Hub would not make that determination. Um, individual grants will not exceed $50,000. Most of what we see come in is for around $50,000, but 
we do get about two to three projects per funding that are actually awarded that are in the, the $20,000 range. So the company does not actually receive the funds. It goes to the not-for-profit, which is another really important aspect because this year I've received a lot of inquiries from manufacturers. And for some reason, it seemed like the message went out that the money was actually going to the manufacturers, but it does go through the not-for-profit. So that's an important uh, a point about the manufacturing grant. Uh, and these are our typical applicants. We have colleges, universities, all of our MEP centers usually uh, submit applications. Um, we have a lot of our economic development entities are now starting to submit applications, um, but it can be any legitimate New York State not-for-profit. We just tell people to make sure that the project makes sense and that you understand what that collaboration is and that the person that you're working with can actually uh, fulfill the administrative roles of working on the application. And obviously the focus is on a manufacturable product or good. We work in every industry sector that you can think of. Um, I get asked a lot of questions about, do you only focus on clean tech? Do you only award universities? And if you go to our website and look at our previously awarded projects, it covers every type of project you can think of. Um, we're starting to see more coming in from um, food and beverage processing now with the craft breweries and things like that. There's a lot of good projects coming in under ag tech, but you know we still see a lot of uh, projects come in for biotech and nanotech and things like that. So you know we 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 field all different types of projects. Uh, these are some of our eligible activities that we have um, anywhere starting out from you know the ideation phase all the way through maturity. I won't read them all for you, but you can kind of see you know, very specific to manufacturing. And we do have an other projects uh, category where if you're working on something that doesn't seem to align up with any of those, I'm happy to have a conversation about eligibility to, to make sure that the project is a good fit for the manufacturing grant. Um, some of our eligible project costs, um, your standard uh, types of, of costs. Um, you know, we ask people to have a, a clearly defined budget and make sure that they can attribute all of the costs back. We do um, cover salaries for research assistants, undergrads, uh, graduate uh, workers, and things like that. Uh, so that's, that's usually a good thing when people see that the, the salaries are covered. Um, the biggest ineligible costs that we have, um, and it's fluctuated back and forth, is for executive salaries. So for 2020, um, FUSA will not cover any salaries for um, an executive, whether it's uh, the CEO, CFO, any of those types of titles, whether it's at the manufacturer or at the not-for-profit. So regardless of the type of work you're doing, if you're the engineer or not, if you're in that um, management team, uh, we won't pay for those costs. But pretty much, you know, we're flexible with people. We try to work with them. And, you know, there's just, you know, some basic ineligible costs that we ask people to, to be on the lookout for. Uh, this is just a sample of you know what we're looking for um, the scoring categories have changed a little bit this year we've um, reduced the points uh, but we've built in a new category which is the alignment with the few submission to go back and make sure that we're really working on projects that are impacting the manufacturing sector um, application process i think is pretty straightforward um, you know pretty simple process you go online you fill out an account you have to upload a couple of documents, upload your budget, uh, submit on the online platform. We have uh, two review processes. It's pretty short, I think, in grant world. Um, and then the awards will be announced in late April for the February round, and then again in late July for uh, the May round. Um, people are, you know, I think, excited because our grants, you know, we, we have an answer for people pretty quickly. It's stayed the same for the last three years. So it's really not um, a long turnaround time in terms of knowing who the awardees are. Uh, some reminders when you're working on the application. Um, the team, uh, this is something that has, another thing that has uh, changed over the last couple of years. Uh, we can have team members that are outside of the state if you have a uh, specific type of expertise or you have a product or something that's within your project budget that's outside of the state. Um, we can do that. We just ask for an explanation. Our panelists like to know the story. Um, if you're looking to pay somebody out of New York State, you know, why is that needed? So we tell people, you know, just include that justification. And as I mentioned, executive salaries um, 
are ineligible. Uh, the conflict of interest letter at the university level, new this year, has to be submitted regardless if you have a conflict of interest or not. So somebody has to sign off saying that, yes, uh, there is a conflict of interest uh, within this project, or no, there's not. It's been something that's uh, come up repeatedly within our, our panelist uh, discussions, and they just want to have a, a sense of knowing that uh, there is or is not a conflict of interest present. Sometimes it can be hard to make that determination. And there's plenty of resources um, available on our website. We have a couple of blogs that we just did. We just did a, a webinar recently to talk about uh, the manufacturing grants. Um, just some other things here, you know, tell a compelling story about the transformational nature. They are still looking for the innovation in your technology and your research <laughs> project. So what is really different about your project? Uh, you know, speak to that uh, where you can. We know some of this is proprietary and confidential. So, you know, some people, you know, tell the story a little bit differently. Our materials uh, stay within Fuse Hub. Um, everything's confidential that's submitted. Um, if you have quantitative data to, pack, to back up your economic impacts, it can be very helpful. Uh, we really want to know about your team and why your team makes sense. Uh, the budget, I can't, uh, you know, Plain enough that we really want detailed justification about, you know, hours. Uh, if you're submitting uh, for a large piece of equipment, we're starting to see that a little bit more often. Um, have a quote in there so that they can understand how you came up with with the number that you have. Um, and then just, you know, making sure that you submit everything that's there and double check your data uh, because we don't go back and, and make changes for anybody. So right now we have one that's open. Um, it'll close at the end of February. We'll have another one that opens up on May 1st for anybody who falls in that category where they couldn't get assistance from the, the not-for-profit that they were looking for. Um, and then they're both, they're due at four o'clock um, on the deadline. It'll, it'll shut off automatically. So that's another thing we encourage people don't try to upload everything at the last minute um, at four o'clock uh, because it will shut down and we have a hard line as to having people be accepted after the deadline. So in regards to our previous winners, um, we have uh, you know, quite a few different types of companies. I tried to put people in here that I've actually went to see and some that might be familiar to some of the people here. So um, Emission Logistics uh, down in the Southern tier, uh, they had a $75,000 manufacturing grant and you know, we're able to see some really great process improvements that, that came out of their, their grant program. Uh, I just took a uh, long uh, trip up to uh, the Shipley Center for Innovation to see several things going on up at Clarkson. So they're actually a repeat winner of ours, $125,000 um, for a, a paint booth and a compressed air system. Um, and they're actually, you know, uh, poised for expansion. So it was really great to see what they're doing, see how they have new employees. Um, it's been really successful program uh, for them, so they can speak to the idea of, you know, applying for one grant and then coming back the next year and uh, really being able to tell their story of growth um, and how the first innovation fund, um, you know, helped to to spur uh, the growth for them. Um, CEG is one of our manufacturing extension partnership centers in the capital region, and they um, worked on a project with Vera to do a biometric gun lock, um, and they're uh, doing really well um, as a company um, looking to expand um, in the capital region as well. Um, we have University of Rochester with uh, Endoglow, um, which is one of our, our medical product companies. And then we have Tech Valley Center of Gravity, $50,000 for a variety of different work, which I think Tammy might be able to speak a little bit about because Mohawk Machine Works is actually working I believe it's the center of excellence right now. Yeah. Um, so that just shows you how they can be based out of the capital region and still work with somebody like uh, the COE. So we have a lot of companies in different parts of the state working with our entrepreneurial and um, our ecosystem to really help make sure that they have all of the different resources that they need. So that was you know, a, a really great project um, for the Tech Valley Center of Gravity, small, um, incubator type membership program um, based in the capital region. And there's plenty, plenty more. Uh, so the next program that we have is our commercialization competition, which is going to be our fourth competition uh, coming up in November, uh, giving away 
um, you know, several million dollars uh, for the commercialization competition. And it's the opposite of the manufacturing grants in terms of the process and, and who we fund. So the commercialization competition is open to manufacturers and early stage companies, uh, not, not for profit. Everything goes directly to, to the company itself. Um, our competition is specific to prototypes. And so last year, one of the changes that we made was, you know, we wanted people to come and actually be able to show and demonstrate their prototype. And we had a lot of really cool technologies there too. Uh, the only thing we don't really work on is software. It's not really in our wheelhouse at Fuse Hub. So some of those types of projects um, have been ineligible in the past couple of years. We do have an investment instrument, uh, which went from a warrant to a safe. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, that it can deter some companies, but for the majority of people, it's something that, that works well. It's a little bit more flexible. And uh, same online application uh, platform for the commercialization competition. So the company has to be a New York State company. We do look at some of the uh, New York State documentation. We do have companies obviously incorporated in Delaware and such. So you know we, we work with people to make sure that they have what they need, uh, pre-revenue less than $100,000. And uh, the company must be able to show the prototype or demonstrate it in video or in person at the time of the competition. Um, intended to help small to medium sized uh, manufacturers or early stage companies where the manufacturing grants really only work with manufacturers. Uh, the commercialization competition will kind of go into some other categories and work with um, different types of companies that may not necessarily be solely in manufacturing. Um, a little bit different scoring, obviously, when we're looking at people's pitch decks, you know, we're going to be looking for different types of um, information. So probably pretty traditional in terms of, you know, the pitch competitions that you, you may have seen with the focus on the commercialization uh, strategy. Uh, kind of the same process, you have to go online, um, different documentation, you have to be able to show the, the, the proof of product prototype might change a little bit this year we haven't finalized the guidelines for the the competition for 2020 so some of this um is still still tentative um because we actually may have a much larger um giveaway this year in terms of individual awards um and then we have different than the manufacturing grants we have a semi-finalist stage and a finalist stage previously people did remote webinars so they would actually do a condensed version of their pitch um, for five minutes and then do a three minute Q&A. And then the people that scored the best out of those would then be invited to come to Albany and do their pitch in Albany. So that may change. We might, we might not do that process this year. It's incredibly administrative for a small staff to do remote webinars and uh, get to that point. So we're trying to figure out what would work best for the people coming through that particular um, platform. And then, as I mentioned, they get invited to come to Albany to pitch for the, the day and a half event. Uh, we're giving away $600,000 this year. So every year we've done it, we've added a little bit more. I believe it's going to be $100,000 each this year, where last year um, we had $50,000 winners and then a, a grand prize winner who won $150,000. Um, or it might be a, a variation, but I, I think we're leaning more towards the $100,000 for, for six winners. Uh, we do have a safe. Um, we have a template that's always available on our website. We've created some materials in the past um, with our legal team to be able to work with people to make sure that they understand what the investment vehicle is. Um, we will have conversations with uh, the manufacturer and uh, any of their investors to kind of see where we might be able to be flexible with them. Uh, Fusehub does not want to um, impede on any, uh, any investment that, that people might be um, in the process of uh, if they end up becoming a winner at the commercialization competition. And we generally try to have all of this material up well in advance before anyone gets to the commercialization competition so that they, they have what they need before they actually make it to the event. Uh, typically for the past three years, it's been around July 15th. It's a 30 day window to apply. I'm pretty sure it's gonna stay roughly at the same time this year. So that's, that'll be the window uh, for, for the competition. These are our winners last year. We have a variety of different uh, types of products, which I think some of them are very familiar uh, in the Syracuse area. We have Calf Buddy with the uh, single use catheter. We have molecular, molecular glasses who were working on a new type of material. 
We have uh, Halamine um, based out of uh, Ithaca, uh, working on an antimicrobial um, material as well, and combined energies and uh, circle optics uh, are two of our other um, awardees for 2019. Our grand prize winner was an ag tech company. Um, you know, she's she's been around uh, New York State. Um, working on a couple of different uh, pitch competitions and and really trying to to uh, move forward with her company. So it was it was exciting for us to be able to uh, you know work with her and uh, get everything finalized. We we just uh, this past week kind of worked through everything with making sure that she was ready to go with her award. So and she's actually in some investment talks right now. So a lot of the things that I wanted to talk about um, were still confidential under under her discussion. So moving on from the Jeff Lawrence Innovation Fund, um, Fuse Hub has a couple of other different uh, programs that I think might be more impactful depending on what you're looking for. So our solutions program um, are actually boots on the ground, uh, working directly with manufacturers. Um, we have a, a system in place where if a manufacturer has any type of business challenge, it could be they're looking for a contract manufacturer, they have a workforce development issue, uh, it, it can be any type of challenge that's, you know, uh, that keeps them up at night, so to speak. Uh, they log into our portal and they're able to work with um, expertise across New York State to, to help them get through those challenges. So they, they go online, uh, they put in all their information, somebody gets back to them within 24 hours. Um, and there, there's a weekly team meeting. So there's different people across the state in different industry sectors. We have people from the Pollution Prevention Institute. We have people done at uh, Cornell's Materials Research. So there's a group of people who are actually dedicated to working with the manufacturers uh, to help them solve these problems. They go out and do site visits of manufacturers and do tours and you know work with people to see um, you know what they can do and what resources are available. Um, as Laura had mentioned in the beginning, we are um, umbrella uh, under funding from NYSTAR, and NYSTAR has over 70 plus assets across the state, of which you know the COE is one. Um, so if you're a manufacturer, you know, someplace in this region and you're looking for an expertise, uh, just because it isn't here, uh, we have the resources to be able to work with you to find out if somebody else in New York State can help you. So um, you know, we tell people, you know, you could be out at a company out on Stony Brook and maybe you need the expertise that's here at the COE. We will partner with that company to tell them what is available here in Syracuse and, you know, they make that collaboration. So it doesn't have to be within the boundaries uh, of where you are. Um, they do a lot of really good work to help make sure that, that companies that want to grow um, are, are made aware of what, what the resources are. Um, and these are just the types of requests, you know, as I mentioned, that, that people work with. Another thing that comes up a lot is uh, IP. So we work a lot with the uh, Science and Technology Law Center. Um, you know, it, when people have those types of requests, um, supply chain, um, process improvements, uh, you know, we have actual engineers and manufacturers who, who can speak more to that technical expertise that the companies might be looking for. Um, and this is one, I was trying to find something in the Syracuse area of one of our success stories, um, full circle feed and kind of some of the things that, you know, they worked with uh, to be able to, to help this company. We have quite a few of them. I just picked one that was uh, in, in the Syracuse area. So, you know, if you have a chance to look at the slide deck at all, you're more than welcome to go and look at the, look at the full story. Uh, some other things that we've, we've worked on, we do a lot of work uh, with the ARCs around New York State to help partner them um, and to be able to use their resources uh, where it might be applicable for manufacturers in terms of packaging, um, logistics, and, and things like that. Um, Spark Charge was one of our very first commercialization competition winners. Um, came here, a Syracuse student uh, started a business and uh, has really grown exponentially, um, relocated out in the Buffalo area and ended up winning a million dollars in the 43 North and has continued to, to grow. And, and Josh has been a really great advocate for Fuse Hub and all of the resources that he's been able to take advantage of. So he's got a really great story. Um, and then, you know, one of the other things we still are working on is the cybersecurity funds that we have for manufacturers. Um, anybody that's in that space, um, 
that might be looking to, to have that type of work done, there are some grant programs for that. Uh, so I'd be happy to put you in touch with the people that could help you. Um, and then we also have a very heavy marketing presence. We, we have a blog, we do podcasts, they have new publications. We do a lot of um, e-newsletters, social media. So we try to get out there, we try to connect and make sure that our manufacturers know uh, what's available throughout the state. Uh, there's a lot of good um, investments, forums that take place. We try to keep people um, you know, in touch with investor, the investor community and anything that will really help them in terms of the, the ecosystem. Uh, this is another new program. I can't speak a lot to this, but I wanted to, to bring this to people's attention because in April, they are going to be doing one of these here in Syracuse. Uh, I've heard really good things about this um, for people who are a little bit more early stage and have that prototype and are looking to, to, to grow the business and uh, scale up. Um, it is going to be a membership program, but they're doing webinars. Uh, it's, it's been... I think they've done a couple of programs so far this year, but I've heard really great things. They did it last year. They uh, reformatted it for 2020, um, but I think it would be something that manufacturers or people looking to get into that space might, might be really interested in. Um, so here's just some uh, additional material. Um, Eric Fasser, he's a new staff member at Fuse Hub, uh, a lot of manufacturing experience. He's the one that's um, heading up this program. So. Um, I'd be happy to put anybody in touch with him and he kind of will have a conversation with you to see if it's something you know that would be a good fit um, for what you're looking for. Um, and then this is the uh, workshop that's coming to Syracuse. I, I think he was literally just here last week in Syracuse trying to finalize where the location, logistics and all of that are gonna be. So um, if anybody's interested in that, I'm sure that uh, the COE will probably help uh, you know market that when it comes out. Uh, we have our New York State Innovation Summit, and I think uh, some of the people in here have, have been to it. Um, it's grown every single year. This year, it's not too far away uh, at Turning Stone. Um, we invite manufacturers to come and exhibit their technologies and uh, showcase what's going on around New York State. Uh, I'm a huge advocate for telling people when they say there's nothing going on here. Um, I've been to uh, pretty much every municipality in the state of New York, and there's somebody doing something really cool everywhere. And I'm always amazed at what I see and what people are doing. So if you have an interest um, in the Innovation Summit, you can certainly check the Fuse Hub website and uh, look for that. I, I believe the registration is uh, out there right now. Uh, for anybody who is really interested, there's a Southern Tier Solutions Forum tomorrow. This is one of the other signature events that uh, the Solutions team does. They do targeted events throughout the state. Um, tomorrow, they're gonna be at Rev Ithaca, um, working with contract manufacturers, uh, but they've done targeted um, medical events that they did in Buffalo last year. Uh, they try to go to each of the different regions and then target a specific uh, topic. So those are, those are really popular um, with manufacturers as well. So that's another one of the um, current events that we have. And then uh, this is just some of the ways that uh, you can get in contact with us. Um, I'm, I'll be happy when they do the Q&A to, to talk to anybody. I'm always uh, working with people on eligibility issues, talking about different types of projects. Um, you know, I can always spend more time with people kind of uh, sharing some of the stories that we have with working, keep working with people around the state. I know Tammy, you know, had, had mentioned to me really about, you know, focusing on the fact that there's a very vibrant ecosystem throughout New York State. I find most people to be incredibly helpful. Um, if they can't uh, answer your question, they usually try to put you in touch with somebody who, who can answer your question. Um, we have a lot of great, uh, great resources around the state and uh, FUSUB is here to help um, facilitate those connections for you. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to help you. So thank you. Julianne, thank you very much for that, for your presentation. Very, very informative. Uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to um, have Joe Dixon speak now, and then we'll have a combined uh, question and answer period for both Joe and Julianne. Ju By the way, just in case, um, because I forgot to introduce myself, uh, in case you don't know, I'm Laura Steinberg. I am the executive director, interim executive director of Syracuse CLA. Uh, so what we have today is uh, is Joe Dixon. We're not going to see his 
his face. We're going to see his, we're going to hear his voice, right, Joe? Yeah, um, if you can hear my voice, I'm here. Great. We're going to see his slides. So Joe is currently the CEO of Ducted Wind Turbines, Inc., and also the recent um, co-founder and CEO of Pelotex. Uh, Joe is a veteran entrepreneur. He served as the founder uh, and or C-level executive of seven high-tech startup firms across multiple industry and technology sectors over a 30-year career. Uh, since uh, his first start out was a spin out from GE and achieved 100 times ROI in three years. Uh, since then, he's been part of six other startups across industry areas as diverse as advanced materials, IT, renewable energy, microelectronics, medical devices, and biotech. Uh, Joe has helped to raise over 500, sorry, over $50 million in venture and private equity capital. Um, He's taught entrepreneurship at Casanova College and Syracuse University, and he was named Entrepreneur of the Year by Syracuse Citizens Foundation uh, all the way back in 1992, early in his career. He has a BS in chemistry from Syracuse and an MBA from University of Rochester. So Joe, let us hear about ducted wind turbines. Thank you, Laura. I appreciate it very much. And uh, um, boy, all the way back in 1992, that was a long time ago. <laughs> So um, I, I did. I was going to just jump right in and tell everybody about what we're doing at Ducted Wind Turbines, um, but uh, Carrie uh, mentioned that uh, she wanted me to kind of go through. Um, uh, hang on, just a second. Oh, there we go. Um, try, try to go through my entrepreneurial history a little bit. So I'd be happy to do that and share with you the ecosystem um, that I uh, experienced back in the '80s and how it's changed today in the Syracuse area, which is uh, pretty monumental. So I spent 10 years with General Electric. I started my first company, Tegman, which uh, was a pretty simple way of bonding copper to ceramic substrates to make different kinds of circuitry. And um, and as uh, as was just mentioned, we started with a, a very, very small pot of money. We never raised any entrepreneurial capital. It was all friends and family. And uh, we just grew it on, on sales. We bought a bunch of used equipment, threw it in the incubator center, which was um, over on Fayette Street at the time, uh, the brand new building over on Fayette Street, um, and uh, and started our company. And uh, we had, the, the thing that was interesting about Tegman is that our back was against the wall from day one. We had to sell product and we had to build product and make sales or we weren't going to survive. And uh, and I think that's, that's um, um, it's it's nice to have the uh, ecosystem and the and and some of the entities that are supporting entrepreneurs today, but but um, but there's no uh, real substitute for um, having to make product and ship it in order to make your company profitable and successful. Anyway, our company was uh, sold to Brush Wellman, which eventually became Materion. Um, the early assistance, I wrote my first business plan when I was at GE and I went to Irving Schwartz at Onondaga Venture Capital. I'd never seen a business plan in my life or knew that one even existed and put it in front of him. And he looked at it and said, this is actually not too bad. You've got all the elements, but there's a lot of work to do. Um, one of my other mentors was Sam Williams, uh, at the, who was the um, uh, a former head of O'Brien and Gear, I believe. And then he was the director, executive director of the Syracuse Incubator, which is over at 1201 East Fayette Street. It's a business center now, but that was the, one of the first incubators in uh, certainly in the area and probably in all of New York State. Um, at the time, we also used the Metropolitan Development Association, which transferred into uh, becoming center state CEO uh, under Rob Simpson. And, and the TDO and the Small Business Development Center and more than anything else, we talk to a lot of other entrepreneurs. How do you do this? You know, and you get little nuggets of information through those connections that are really important. Like don't build a factory first, go out and sell product and make and do customer discovery and make sure you've got a market for your product. Just little things like that. And these, these are mantras now that are, are voiced through uh, many of the organizations that, um, that I, I, I've worked with. Uh, recently as, as an EIR as well. But back then, um, it, the only way you could learn that was from other um, entrepreneurs. So uh, as uh, as was mentioned, Tegman was enormously successful. We sold the company to Brush Woman for a, about 100x ROI. 
And I told everybody, well, that was pretty easy. I think I'll do it again. And um, when I teach entrepreneurship, I, it's like, it's like I stepped to the plate the first and hit the first pitch out of the stadium and thought, well, I guess I'll do this again and again and again. And since then, it hasn't worked out like that, not at all. Um, so I did a little bit of M&A work after Tegman, and then I was with Drug Risk Solutions in Saratoga Springs. Um, uh, that company uh, eventually uh, did not make it, went out of business. IDSA became enormously successful after I left, um, but... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, I'm not sure I had anything to do with that. And then I was at Syracuse University and then with Innovation Fuels and E2E. And as was mentioned, Pelotex. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about Pelotex. So we licensed some technology from Syracuse University. In 2015, nanotechnology that had application in life science, specifically in, um, in liquid biopsy, blood tests for early cancer detection. We, uh, we raised uh, some money uh, through some of the um, uh, 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 ecosystem in the, some of the entities and ecosystem in the area, Center State CEO, Launch New York. Um, and, um, and we were able to about get the product about 80% ready for market. And unfortunately that was not quite good enough. And so what we had to do and our, our, our CTO actually left the company in the fall of 2019 so my other partner and I, uh, we went out and we were able to find a, a sub-licensee and we are sub-licensing the technology to a very large pharmaceutical company who we hope will make it very successful. And, um, and then we're putting the company into stasis mode, kind of like in a coma, uh, so it'll exist, but it won't have any operations or payroll. And the reason we're doing that is because above all things, we want to pay our note holders back on the money that we took in order to get that company started and up and running and as far as we did. And um, that is the most important thing that we can possibly do. And so having the, um, the hope of being able to do that through royalties that will be paid over the next uh, 10 years, five to 10 years on the products that will be produced by this large life science company, we are very hopeful that they will be successful. Kind of at the same time, I uh, um, transitioned into ducted wind turbines, uh, where I'd been an EIR for NYSERDA uh, for the last um, uh, probably two years or so. Um, this is some additional um, entrepreneurial experience. When I was with, with Syracuse University, I started the Southside Innovation Center, which was really one of the first lifestyle business incubators in the country back in 2007. And that was, um, that was a bit of a challenge because I'll all incubators are pretty much high tech and connected with a major university. But um, Syracuse University had the um, actually brilliant and creative idea to start a, an incubator on the south side of, of the city. And that is still in operation and doing quite well as, as, as far as I know. I have mentored and advised hundreds of other entrepreneurs. Oh, and while we were down there, we also started at the South State Innovation uh, Center, a small enterprise loan program which was enormously successful for people starting lifestyle and uh, small enterprise type businesses. Over the last several years, I've been a NYSERDA entrepreneur in residence for NextCore, for the Tech Garden in Syracuse, and for Columbia Technology Ventures as well. Um, and uh, participated, been able to participate and mentor teams in the Nexus program and hardware scale up for the Clean Tech Center and as a general EIR for whatever might be needed. As far as the ecosystem goes, um, it is quite a bit a different landscape today than it was in the 1980s. And I did not have room for all of the um, uh, logos uh, of the different entities that are available uh, for anyone that would like to start uh, a company, like to start a, a venture. But here are some of them. And I can uh, say honestly that I've taken advantage of every entity on this page in, in one way, shape or form or I've, I've worked with them or side by side to help other entrepreneurs. So um, it is a very vibrant eco ecosystem in central New York between in, in, the, in the corridor between um, Albany and Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo, and even down to Binghamton up to Watertown and Potsdam. And, uh, and it's becoming more so, and it's really exciting to see that happen over the course of my career. Um, I, when I started off at GE, I never ever envisioned myself leaving GE to start my own company. And, uh, and when I finally did that in 1988, um, and uh, all of my friends and family thought I was crazy, 
it actually turned into a very interesting and creative career, which I'm very thankful for. And where I am right now is building these small wind turbines. And uh, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about uh, ducted wind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and she and she is running. And if you'd like to see that turbine, I'm going to show you a a website uh, that you can go online and watch our turbine that's on the roof of the camp building up to um, up at uh, uh, not the camp building, the tech building up at Clarkson. So the problem is small wind has higher energy costs. It does not scale down well. It scales up really well. That's why they're building them the size of two football fields right now, putting them out in the ocean. But unlike solar, it doesn't scale down really well and it has a very long ROI. So op open wind turbines um, have been a problem because they just don't gather enough wind to make enough electrons. And it's, as always, it's always about the environment, but it's always more about the economic. If it's not um, economical, if it does not produce power at a, a cost that can be competitive, then it's just not going to work. So our market driver is cost per kilowatt hour, and um, uh, Dr. Ken Visser, a few years ago, developed um, a very unique um, ducted turbine where the, uh, the rotor is mounted aft in the turbine. And, um, and basically what he did as an aeronautical engineer is he wrapped an airplane wing around the turbine such that it acts like a, uh, um, it kind of takes advantage of the Bernoulli principle and brings in about twice as much air as the size of the rotor. And so that allows the turbine to become cost effective and drops the levelized cost of energy. So it is a little bit, it, it's pretty close to being competitive with solar. And at the same time, it provides an augmentation to solar and to diesel. So that is the solution of what we came up with. It is a patent out of Clarkson University and um, Dr. Wind Turbine has a, an exclusive license for that patent. So our business strategy is, uh, is basically to be a very capital light manufacturing um, with significant outsourcing. I'll get to uh, our, our, our basic model in a minute, but we aim to be the turbine in a box where we can order the parts, we can have them drop shipped uh, directly to the site and assembled by capable hands like uh, an Ikea turbine in a couple of hours and erected. Uh, that would make it very, very efficient for emergency power, um, so you think of places, and this is another problem, small wind has not done well in the U.S. Um, and uh, for a variety of reasons, but one is because not a lot of residential people are going to put a wind turbine up on their house and even on, in rural areas and farms, you will, you will see very, very few of them. And the reason is because they're pretty expensive. Um, they're not that cost effective. They haven't been that cost effective. And it's not really the, the place where you can sell um, hundreds and thousands of turbines. And if you're going to uh, create a market or you're going to enter this market, you want to be able to sell lots and lots of turbines, just like there are lots and lots of roof-mounted solar panels going up on, on houses all across the country today. And the places you're going to do that are where power is very expensive, like the Caribbean, and, and, uh, and where there, or power is non-existent like where there are 2 billion people across the planet that do not have power right now. So our business strategy is to have a very capital light manufacturing, assemble our first units up in Potsdam, and then we ship the parts directly to the assemble uh, site. And we're also marketing ourselves as an augmentation to solar and fossil fuel. Uh, that would be diesel engine systems uh, that create power. So you think of remote villages up in Canada or um, uh, uh, places in the desert, uh, industrial mining operations, any place where power is needed, but there's no grid in sight. That's where we can be very, very effective. Our strategy is to um, establish very strong partnerships and, uh, and leading to volume sales and financial partnerships to offer lease options as well. Lots of our, our, our customers will be large companies that are building microgrids in um, in places uh, that uh, that don't have power, or they're putting in um, uh, a power augmentation at uh, at cell towers, or remote villages that don't have power, as I, as I just mentioned. These are our, the target markets that we're going for, and not just walking into these villages and trying to sell turbines, but working with the companies that are building the microgrids and the and the emergency preparedness facilities and putting and installing the cell towers. 
those will be the customers of Duck and Wind. The addressable market is uh, enormous uh, for all of, in all of these areas, um, with uh, you know really huge uh, CAGRs, and so we are looking to just make a dent in this marketplace if we can over the next two or three years uh, by aligning ourselves with the companies that are working in these four particular areas. Um, so. The key, the key takeaway from this slide is if small wind could reach only 10% of rooftop solar market, that would be a $7.7 .7 billion market. So again, the solar market has grown in leaps and bounds because it scales down nicely. If now that we have a method of scaling wind down uh, to a five or 10 kilowatt uh, turbine, um, now we've got something that can augment solar and uh, as we like to say, the wind or uh, the sun doesn't shine at night, but the wind blows. And so we can continue to make electrons round the clock for each of those target markets that we just talked about. Um, the competition is um, is here. The Berge XL has been like the go-to standard. It's a and the XL10, uh, which is a a uh, 10 kilowatt system. Ours, uh, by comparison is about a six to seven kilowatt uh, system. So it'll it'll output just about enough power to run your household for a year. That's about the average household is about seven seven kilowatts. So the Bergy 10 is a little bit overkill, but the cost of a Bergy 10 is about $80,000, 80 to 100, and the cost of our turbine is projected to be about 25 to 30. So a uh, huge uh, price difference. And that's because uh, we're using a lot of, uh, we're doing a lot of tooling up and we're using um, inexpensive parts. And also because our turbine creates twice the power at half the height. So we don't have to put it up on a hundred foot pole. You can put it on a 40 foot pole and you can, uh, and stay under the ordinances, uh, the, uh, the local limitations of many localities and, and, uh, and, and metropolitan areas and still produce power. So as I mentioned before, the cost per kilowatt hour is the uh, determining factor in how efficient and effective wind can be. Um, you can see the different costs there of kilowatt hour and ours is below 280, that's installed. That's not what you'd pay per kilowatt hour. Most people are, are paying somewhere in, in, in uh, central New York in the area of uh, 10 to 20 cents. Um, but this is the installed uh, cost compared to our direct competition. Here's where we're gonna succeed. We are the turbine in a box. We have a superior economic value proposition. Um, we can drop ship it anywhere. It's very rugged and reliable and, uh, and, and the parts are going to be very robust. Uh, it is being tooled right now, our Gen 2 unit, which I'll talk about in a minute. It's gonna be very easy to assemble. Uh, like I said, IKEA, A goes to B, B goes to C. It goes up on a monopole or on a, um, on a lattice pole or on a telescoping pole in uh, virtually four to six hours and you're creating electrons, you're creating power. And we have multiple market applications which make it very versatile. Our team, as I mentioned, Dr. Ken Visser is our co-founder, um, aero, aerospace engineer and um, and Paul Pavone, our, another co-founder, they started the company back in 2016 as an LLC, migrated to a C Corp in 2019. And uh, I've been advising them um, on everything from fundraising to financing to business strategy and marketing strategy for the last several years. Um, besides me, we have Ken Camarco, Mike Derrick, and Doug Berkeley. Some of you might know Doug Berkeley from, uh, from uh, uh, High Tech Rochester and the Nexus program. And we are continuing to gather a good team of, um, of other uh, uh, entrepreneurs and creative minds and uh, experienced people around us to, uh, to help ensure our success as we move forward. So this is the Gen 1 install. This happened uh, last uh, March um, up in Clarkson and uh, on the roof. This was uh, the Gen 1 uh, version of our turbine that went up. Uh, there were two Gen uh, 1 versions built. One went into a wind tunnel, and this was the second one. And it has been up and running since then, generating data. And the data is uh, exactly what we hoped it would be. It is meeting or exceeding our uh, projected power output. Actually, it's exceeding it. Um, and uh, we are in a place right now where we're about to collect 
about um, 10 months of data, eight, eight, 10 months of data, and, um, and put it into a data report. Um, so that uh, here's the test data, not that it means anything right now, but, um, but it has been uh, putting out the energy that we have projected that it would. Here's our Gen 2 product, uh, which we're selling right now. We are actually receiving orders um, for our Gen, 2, our Gen 2 product. This is a 12 foot diameter, basically the same thing as the Gen 1, except it has five blades instead of three. Um, and it, it is going to be, the, the duct is roto molded um, plastic and um, very inexpensive, but very robust. Uh, it's what what kayaks are made of, and a lot of toys and large uh, large things like that. And um, and these will be we are are selling uh, some of them to individuals right now on a one off basis. Uh, that's not our target market, as I mentioned, but it's going to allow us to debug it and to over the uh, the first uh, two three quarters of this year uh, get some up and running, gather some data, and then uh, we plan to use that to. Um, do some final design tweaks and come out with our Gen 3 unit in the uh, third to fourth quarter of 2009, um, 2020 for sale in early 2021. And we are already getting requests for quote for up to 200 turbines at a time. So we believe our marketing strategy is sound and we plan to uh, execute on it. So here are some of the accomplishments uh, that we have to date. Um, we just did receive a $200,000 grant from NREL and uh, we just received, uh, it's, not, it's not even on here, but an ignition grant from NYSERDA too. We're very thankful for that support um, as well. And uh, we opened a convertible debt round to raise uh, 750,000. We've got about, actually it's not 200, it's almost 300,000 of that already subscribed. And we are also looking uh, to raise one large chunk of about $502 million, probably in Q3 of this year. And so we're having those discussions right now it takes you know six to six to ten months in order to close uh, a funding deal, so uh, it doesn't happen overnight. And we have our exclusive technology license with Clarkson University in place. So our 2020 goals are to uh, secure some additional funding and really launch sales and manufacturing. This will be Ducted Wind's breakout year. We are already taking orders for single units, um, and we are taking down payments. We received uh, one today, as a matter of fact. Um, we are also building uh, two units on the NREL grant for third-party certification. One will go at the wind test site up at Clarkson, and one will go to Intertech at Tully Hill down in Cortland, uh, or near Cortland, uh, for third-party certification. And we're doing all the things that a young startup company has to do, moving from the lab and transitioning out to our own uh, uh, design and assembly site, which will be located in, in Potsdam, New York, or somewhere very near there. Um, we are securing partnerships with large global contract sales. Um, we are also securing partnerships for the downstream electronics. We make the, the um, our claim to fame is the head of the turbine itself, not the, um, the other three components, the inverter, the controller, and the generator are all purchased separately and, um, and, and uh, assembled. And we purchase them from third party uh, sources. And we hope to secure a leasing partnership to facilitate multiple unit sales. A lot of companies are going to say, well, we'd love to bring in 500 turbines and put them in Puerto Rico, but we can't uh, do that um, because it's going to hurt our balance sheet. So we've already started discussions with, um, with leasing companies who can facilitate those sorts of sales. And our goal is to find uh, uh, an acquisition partner, acquiring partner in three to five years. And we believe we'll be able to do that if we can execute on time and on budget. This is a, uh, last I want to end with this, this is a rendering of a new resort that is going, uh, being built right now at Saranac, Saranac Water Front Lodge. If you know that area, it's right on Fl uh, Lake Flower. And you can see uh, in, in this picture, a turbine on either side of that. And uh, the developer of this resort, Skyward, um, uh, Skyward Hospitality has already, um, indicated that they want to purchase at least one turbine and perhaps as many as five and put them up there along with solar. It, they, they plan on being, this is going to be the first LEED um, uh, certified resort in, in New York State. And so they're very proud of that fact as well. And I will end there. And if anyone has any questions about either uh, my career or the ecosystem or ducted wind, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you very much.
very much for your presentation. Julian. You more than welcome. You, you, you probably don't know that, you know, we have, uh, we owe you special thanks because you're the first um, person that we brought in via webinar to give their presentation. We think it worked out pretty well. So it kind of opens the door to future opportunities. So I just want to invite Julian back up and uh, open the floor for questions for either Joe or Julian. Anybody? And so this is down here and it's over. So <laughs> I wondered if you could tell us. So your program, GitHub offers this incredible wealth of programs that because it has so much depth, looks like it's been in place for you know multiple decades. But the truth is it's really fairly new. And I wondered for the companies that are interested in applying if you can speak just a little bit to the change, how the competitiveness of the competition has evolved over the next few years. Yeah, so I mean, we we see a variety, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, of different companies coming into the program, and we see a lot of them. You know, there's a lot of companies that don't get funded. So you know, we we have that uh, the applicant pool is, is really large. I think in the very beginning, when they started working with companies, it was really focused very heavily on the R and D and innovation and technology. And I think while it's uh, still a critical point I, I think that it's moving more towards making sure that we're we're working with people who are indeed going to manufacture something so a lot of these projects have really long lead times um so it, it just in, in some people the the project is is really long in duration and not that it's that it's good or bad um i think competitively we're seeing a lot more coming in from our community colleges, um, companies that are, are working with interns. Um, and then we're also starting to see competitively. <laughs> Joe, your, your desktop is on the laptop, is on the webinar. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 yeah, your email's up there. There you go. Okay, I'm sorry. Very good. Thank you, Joe. So I, I think competitively, we're starting to see a lot more projects coming in assisting small manufacturers. We have um, a lot more uh, multi-use equipment, so a piece of equipment that's being purchased to help. You know, we, there's a project out of Queens um assisting uh, more on the small scale uh, food processing side but they want they uh were awarded for a project um for a piece of equipment that would help like 10 to 15 small manufacturers um we have pro so i think we're just starting to see a change in the types of projects while we still get really great projects that are um you know innovative we have the biotech the nanotech that that are really um, highly specialized, but then we're also starting to see more of just traditional manufacturing projects. So I think that's changed, and I think that the scoring um, is reflective of that. Just making sure that as we grow and evolve, that we're reviewing projects for what we're we're seeing come in. Um, I think there's, I think that there's a, a misconception that Fuse Hub only works with a certain clientele. So the one question I get asked a lot is, you know, you're only working with universities. We all, it looks like you guys only fund university projects. And I try to tell people it looks that way, but we do, if you look at the, the overall applicant pool and who's coming in, I think that we do a good job of assisting everybody. We have no claim to regionalization. It's whatever project if six projects came out of buffalo that were great that's who would get funded it's not okay we need to get a project in syracuse we need to get a project in the capital region we really try to the panel reviews it and um, it's the best of the best that comes out of that applicant pool and each time it'll be different we we don't see as many repeat projects as you would think somebody will come in and then we get a handful of people that come back but then there's a whole variety of new projects that come in so you know, we and we're starting to see a lot more collaborations um, that Joe had on the screen with, you know, a lot of those entities in the ecosystem. We see a lot of that. So people that are coming through different incubators or they've been out, you know, here working with Kathy or the COE or they have worked at NextCore in Rochester and have gone through some of the other programs. So we're starting to see more of that kind of come in, I think, as 
you know, uh, FUSEP has grown and, and the grant um, has grown, but the types of projects, we, we just, we literally get everything from equipment to materials research to um, 3D printing to robotics. So it's, it's really project dependent on, on what people are looking for and, you know, what collaboration, you know, the, the university is looking for. So it's, it's evolving. <laughs> yeah. Good question. Um, would uh, animal lab testing or human factors evaluation be an eligible um, project if it's to support data, to support validation of product design? I know. I think that those there, there's a couple of different there's a couple of things that come in I think that are in like a, a gray area. So it's probably just getting. I would just recommend a call and have it like a further conversation because we. There's not a whole lot of things that are truly ineligible. I know software is up there for us, and I know that the the, the lab trials are an important um, component for certain industries and, and what they're working on. So I would just probably get a little bit more information before saying yes or no to that one. Anybody else? In your last round for the innovation fund, how many applicants did you have for how many awards? Uh, you know, believe it or not, uh, it being a statewide program, we get over 40, but if you think about it in terms of New York State, it's not, not an incredible amount, but it's also a very manageable amount for the small staff that we have. If, if we, if this round we get 100, we would definitely have to pull in other people to be able to kind of manage that, but um, we gave uh, for, uh, between anywhere between 30 and 50, and then we award six. So it still is fairly competitive. So we tell people, you really have to spend time um, fine tuning what that story is you're telling and, and, and what your innovation is. And I did forget to mention that I actually, when I was in uh, Potsdam, I actually saw the uh, turbine up at, uh, up at Clarkson. So I've um, met with Ken and um, he's very passionate about that project. It's a really cool technology. Um, so it's great to be in different parts of the state to see what people are actually working on, but um, no shortage of people looking for grant funds around the state. Um, so we're always happy to, to help people and, and make sure that, you know, if they're interested in working on a project that, you know, they're going down the right path and, and that they don't submit an application and then get discouraged because it's something that could be, you know, ineligible. We try to work with people uh, in the beginning. Anything else? Yes. What are some of the nonprofits that you get for some of these kind of work with you all? So we see a lot of um, we see a lot of incubator programs. We see community colleges. We're starting to see places like I can speak like in the capital region. Like um, there's a uh, an organization called Cade, and they work with um, agricultural com agricultural companies. But more, I, I'm seeing a lot in the the incubator programs. Um, our our MEP centers is generally where I tell somebody in the community to start with. Um, some of these other um, grant programs are working with people like, you know, Cornell has the Rev Ithaca. That's, you know, uh, a program that I, I, you know, would steer people to. We we tend to stay a little bit off of really telling somebody where to go um, because we want people to use uh, the not for profit as the collaboration. So we don't want to say, okay, you know, uh, your your chamber of commerce could could write an application because. We want it to be, we don't want it to be somebody writing an application. It has to be somebody that wants to administer the project, somebody who's supportive of manufacturing, understands what your needs are. So it can be any legitimate not-for-profit, but we see it primarily our MEP centers, um, places that are similar to our MEP centers, our economic development, like um, Saratoga County economic development, like places like that, we're starting to see see more of that come in. So those those make sense. They're 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 in the community. They understand what the manufacturing needs are, but it, it can be anybody. I mean, there's there's so many you know potential collaborators, but that's kind of what we see. And I, I would encourage someone, you know, just to go to their regional MEP if they're a manufacturer, and then have that conversation, because everybody only gets one. They can only write one application. So if they're already in the queue with somebody, you know, they may have to bump out until May. But uh, they 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 generally have a good idea of who would. Um, who would want uh, to to partner with somebody because we don't know what people's bandwidth is at any point in time, and we don't want people to think that you know that's our like our advice is to go go to that person. We try to say this is a holistic 
uh, approach and, and these are some of the programs you know that we work with and we guide people in that way. So I just have to plug the universities also, you yeah. know, and the centers that are managed and run by the universities, like their QCOE, like the Biotech Accelerator, and some of the other certain this area. Yep. Yeah, we've got to. I was going to say, yeah, the university, aside from the universities that have multiple departments, um, those are those are the places that we go to. And we deal a lot with the universities. Yeah. Yeah, many of us here are familiar with the CMY TDO. Mm -hmm. At least I didn't realize there was a statewide MEP. Could you tell us how, what the relationship is? Is it overlapping, complementary, competitive? Uh, <laughs> What's the deal? So yes, so we are, that is your regional and um, SKUSUB is the statewide MEP and we connect. So if we, if somebody makes an inquiry to us, you know, we certainly want to outreach with TDO to make sure that the, there's a, a connection there. I think the, the goal is to be able to make sure that um, everybody's working with everybody and everybody knows what all of the resources is because they are regional. And so making sure that you know, somebody in Buffalo, if they have a client there and they need to have expertise, you know, making sure that Fuse Hub is, you know, Fuse Hub comes in and, and helps market everybody and the expertise of not only the MEP centers, but all of the resources that, that are available. So arguably somebody who's working with TDO here and is not familiar with the programs you just described, TDO should be pushing them towards Fuse Hub. Sure, sure. I mean, you know, I think that for the most part, I think we have, you know, I, I'm pretty confident we have great working relationships in all of them. They should know what we all do. I mean, I came out here to Syracuse and um, took the Export New York program through TDO. So I try to, you know, help get the message. I think we all try to make sure that we're all, you know, connecting people and, and facilitating those, those relationships. But we may meet somebody at a different event who doesn't know about the TDO. So then we would help, you know, facilitate that, that dialogue for them just to make sure that we're, we're providing support to those people. I had a question for Joe. Hey, okay, I'm here. Yeah, uh, hey, uh, if you were to talk to your uh, 30 year old self, where would you send your uh, 30 year old self today to start a new business? What field would you send them into? Uh, no, which, you know now. Oh, 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 what, what business would I send them into? Yeah. Uh, wow. <laughs> well, that's a, that's, a, that's a very interesting area. I, you know, I would have to say one that you know, um, one that you have experience in, one that you can can do. Um, and I, I and I'll, I'll give you a little background on this. So uh, when we started Tegman, um, uh, it was based on a technology called direct bond copper. I was the world's expert in direct bond copper because GE invented it, and I moved it into manufacturing. And when I started the company. Um, I knew everything about making direct bond copper that there was to know. And so um, so let's juxtapose that against the last company I started, Pelotex, um, where we licensed technology out of, uh, out of Syracuse University, uh, brought in a professor as a partner, um, knew how to promote it, knew what it did only from talking to the professor and other people. And there was no way that my other partner or I could walk out and make uh, nano gradient uh, beads or, or, or anything else. I did not know enough about the technology or about what it could do and did not have the right hands-on approach. So I don't think it matters so much what particular area, whether it's clean tech or life science or, or, or software or drones or where you wanna go into business, Make sure it's something that you have a deep embedded knowledge and passion about more than anything else. Um, and or somebody on your on your team does, but mostly you. If you're the CEO and if you're the founder, make sure you you you, you know what you're doing <laughs> instead of just trying to appropriate somebody else's technology and uh, and and promote it, build a company on it. It's really hard to do. It's not impossible, but it's more difficult to do it that way. Hope I hope that answered your question. Yeah, it sure did. Hey, could you uh, drill down into your relationship with uh, National Grid? What do you hope uh, your relationship will be like with the National Grid? We are behind the meter. Um, so we supply, our, our, our little ducted uh, turbines supply power to uh, the grid in the house. Uh, not so much uh, uh, the grid that's going out 
onto uh, uh, now there are certain um, uh, regulations with regard to that as far as you know how you net meter and things and I and I don't know quite enough about that to speak intelligently uh, about it so um, I I, I kind of just fell into my own my own trap that I <laughs> about not knowing what I'm what I'm talking about but um, uh, really, our market is not in the United States. Our market is outside of the United States. We'll sell a few turbines in New York. We'll probably sell a few down south and out west. But that's not our, our claim to fame. We want to bring power to people that do not have power. Um, people in Africa, people in South America, people in the Caribbean, where power is 50 to 60, 70 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and up in the northern reaches of Alaska, um, that's that's where our market is, and so it's uh, we really do not will not have a relationship with um, with National Grid or or RG and E or, or anybody like that. Uh, great. And just one last question: What surprises you about the Syracuse technology environment and the technology space? I guess watching it grow over the past uh, 30, 35 years. Um, uh, Irving Schwartz and Sam Williams are, are long gone now, but uh, but they were they were so instrumental to me and in, in helping. I, I mean, I knew nothing. I was a lab rat at GE with a you know a four page business plan about how to start this company, and um, and and these uh, you know these guys who had been around um, they hadn't seen a lot of startup work. Well, Ir Irving saw a little bit um, at Onondaga Venture Capital. But, um, but Sam Williams really hadn't that much, but still they knew the components that were necessary in order to make a venture engine run. And, um, and they just kept saying, keep it simple and execute, keep it simple and execute. And those are the things, those are the mantras that I, I, I still remember to this day. Well, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, I guess that's it. So thank you to both of our speakers. We really appreciate your being here and uh, are pleased to welcome everybody to stay and join us for some refreshments and more conversation out in the hallway. Thanks for coming. Okay. Thank you.